Hello and welcome to my new podcast, Air and Space Stories. Are you ready for an exciting news? Fasten your seatbelts and enjoy your flight with me, Cinzia. This is episode 4, season 1. In this episode, I will tell you some of the three most romantic and fascinating stories of the aviation and space. Maybe you don't know that some mascots have made journeys even outside the Earth's atmosphere. The first story, in fact, is about space. Snoopy is the NASA mascot. It is well known that back in the days of the Apollo missions, NASA signed a contract with Charles Schultz, the creator of Peanuts, to sponsor a special team dedicated to mission safety. The birth of this original union, which lasted to the present day, originated in a very unfortunate event. In 1967, shortly before the launch of the Apollo 1 mission, Virgil Grissom, Edward White and Roger Chaffee died in the cabin atop the Saturn V during a test. An electrical arc caused a fire in the cabin and because it was closed from the outside, the astronauts were trapped inside and died in the fire. This tragedy prompted NASA to increase controls during processes and to minimize the risk of events like that occurring again. For example, the composition of the air inside the cabin was changed, making it less flammable. At that precise moment, to reward those who had worked hard at the vigorous growth, NASA decided to give them a pin, the famous Silver Snoopy, donated by astronauts to engineers, technicians and to people who did not hold a command category within NASA. From then on, Snoopy remained in the agency on all subsequent missions. A documentary, a short film, made by Ron Howard with Jeff Goldblum, talks about a mysterious character on board the Apollo missions. It is, of course, Snoopy. He was always an extra crew member and no one except agency personnel knew him on board. Snoopy's story did not end with Apollo but continued to the present day. He was also on board the Artemis One mission. There is a nice video illustrating the making of Snoopy's suit, uh, which was designed and made to conform to the original. Both in the material used, the fabric is exactly the same as the astronaut suit, and in details. Snoopy was also equipped with a special sensor called the Zero Gravity Sensor that will record the precise moment when he would enter the microgravity and will float in a spacecraft. Finally, Apple, on its Apple TV streaming platform, broadcasted a series of cartoons named Snoopy in Space. These are short live uh, episodes, about 10 minutes each, very cute and funny, mostly for children. However, for Snoopy, flying is nothing new. Snoopy has always had a very intimate relationship with flying. You remember him when abroad his doghouse, he simulated a dogfight dogfight <laughs> with the Red Baron and Friedrich von Richthofen wearing a leather helmet, goggles and with a scarf, always pulled thought as if he were really flying. On this occasion Snoopy became the real flying ace. Now I tell you another beautiful story related this time to airplanes and Walt Disney. First using commercial aviation, the private aviation, whose potential he realized before others, Disney traveled the world to follow all his projects. A bit like Snoopy, he has always been a lover of flying. It seems that when he was just a boy at the end of World War I, he paid a French pilot to fly with him in his warplane. And although he never obtained a pilot license, he was a forerunning the use of the more flexible business aviation. During his lifetime, he bought several airplanes. The first, in 1963, a Beechcraft Queen Air 80 turboprop, and when jets were affordable enough, he was captivated by a Gulfstream G159. I think that also Elon Musk owns a jet from the same company. If you want to know more about that, uh, the episode number one talks about Elon Jet. Anyway, this Gulfstream is a, was a fast 15-seat aircraft capable of taking him quickly from one place to another in the USA, from California to Florida, to follow the making of his film in remote locations. 
It is said that the location used years later for Pirates of the Caribbean was discovered during those trips, but also to follow the Florida project, that's to say the construction of the Disney World in Orlando. Later, Disneyland in Los Angeles was also built. I was lucky enough to visit both parks years ago. They were fantastic experiences, I would say unforgettable, and no matter the age you leave them, they stay in your heart forever. So do all his films and characters, of course. Disney used this airplane as a real office. He could leave uh, when he wanted and arrive where he wanted, and of course, he took all his stuff with him. He had a very personal workstation at this disposal from which he made sketches. But why I am telling you about the Walt Disney Airplane? Firstly, because the Gulf Trim had a very special livery dedicated to his first character, Mickey Mouse. Initially registered with a different number plate, it was later given the number November 234 MM by the FAA. Although the FAA said to have randomly assigned this number plate, most people consider it a tribute both to the mouse, but especially to his creator Walt Disney. Mickey Mouse portrait appears on the rudder and represents him in a most classic way we all know. To better meet his travel needs, they advise him to change aircraft and buy a new turboprop version which, with a high range and the ability to land on short runways, would take him anywhere. Unfortunately, the great Disney left his world too early at only 65 years old, and therefore this order was cancelled. However, even after his death, his beloved Gulfstream did not immediately end its life, quite the contrary, after being used again by the staff for another 20 years to complete many other projects, it was grounded in 1992 after 30 years of honorable service, with no interiors, no engines and no other perishable equipment. Subsequently, he was taken to the Disney MGM theme park, where he remained until 2014. Now, it has been recently decided that the mouse, this is how they call the airplane, will forever stay close to its owner in Palm Springs, in the Aviation Museum. Moreover, renovation work has been announced last December. This will replicate the cabin and its interiors, especially Walt Disney's favorite station, equipped with an altimeter, a clock with a Mickey Mouse figure and a telephone with which he could talk to the pilots. As a surprise for visitors, the designers thought of putting a silhouette of Walt's profile at the window of his seat. If it happened to return to the United States, I will for sure visit this museum. Finally, I want to tell you another amusing story this time, also related to the world of aviation, not private but military. I am referring to the fact that the Swiss acrobatic team, called Patrouille Suisse, has a special mascot. Let me do a small premise. The team flies six F5 Grandmont Tigers, not very new fighters but very agile, which allow the pilots to perform their fantastic acrobatic maneuvers like our Frecce Tricolori. You know, that I'm Italian, right? In this regard, I published an episode on my podcast Articoli in Voce dedicated to last October's air show in Alassio, Liguria. The mascot I'm telling you about is something I have in common with the Patrouille Suisse. It is the very famous Levi's yellow puppet Flat Eric, who first appeared in 1999 in a commercial. Remember him in the car uh, next to his human driver shaking his head in the time to the music? Well, this puppet was also the protagonist of the video of the song itself, composed by a well-known French DJ, Mr. Oiseau. Flatbeat was the title of that song. It is amazing how famous this character is. Even today, there are Instagram profiles that portray him in all sorts of ways, as if he were a real person on holiday, while bathing, even while eating, sleeping or listening to music. There is something for everyone. Not for nothing, even mine, whose name is Zeccolino, is dressed up and has acquired a wardrobe. The flat Eric of the Swiss acrobatic petrol is called Flatty, with an umlaut on the A, and he is an honorary member and veteran pilot. He joined the team in 2000. 
a year after its creation, actually. Then it was kidnapped in 2004 by the Red Arrows, which is the British acrobatic patrol, and returned a couple of years later in 2006. It is for this reason that Flatty wears a test pilot suit, orange in color, with the Union flag. <laughs> you won't believe it, but Flatty is always aboard aircraft number two at every air shore since then. The host pilot has been photographed several times with the canopy open, proudly showing Flatty to the public. I consider the Patrouille Suisse uh, to be one of the best. Not only because I have admired them in action both for work and pleasure, I can tell that its pilots are very good and precise, they never miss an alignment, but also because in my opinion they are a little crazy for having maintained this relationship with a super mascot over the years. They are so attached to Flatty that they even portray and describe him in the petrol brochure that is published every year on the official website and in which the pilots, the program of events are presented to the world. Not only is there a photo of Flatty with the pilots and aircraft, but he even has his page as a pilot of the petrol. Please have a look at their website. I really love these guys. There are probably other mascots who have been in aeronautics or space, but these were the three whose exciting stories I wanted you to know. They teach us that cultivating a childlike side is not always a sign of immaturity. You don't have to be serious to be professional. On the contrary, having a connection to childhood can even increase creativity and can help make our dreams come true. I will end this episode with a marketing note. Mascots can help companies, I am now thinking about NASA especially, to expand their sphere of influence and popularity even among the youngest. A future astronaut or engineer could be hidden among them. NASA understands it very well. Over the years, in fact, the agency has been able to transform itself from a very close to a modern open company. NASA broadcasts live every day on its uh, YouTube channel and constantly communicates on all social media from TikTok to LinkedIn, from Facebook to Instagram. During major missions, it organizes artistic challenges, inviting the followers to make drawings or photos inspired by the subject of the mission itself. I hope that this episode has excited you as it has excited me in deepening these stories. Maybe you two have a personal mascot to whom you are particularly attached. Thanks for flying with me again this week. I hope you had a very pleasant flight and look forward to seeing you on board next week too. Bye bye from Cinzia. <laughs> <laughs>